Salutations one all. So a few weeks back I made a video, six things I hated about Ruby Volume 7, but in all things, there must be balance. So this is my six things I loved about Ruby Volume 7, and quite frankly, I am way more excited about this video than the last because I am not a negative person. I truly hate very little in this world. If I start watching anything, I basically need to watch it all the way to the end because I just get so fascinated. And she's like, oh, what's going to happen next? Oh, I didn't see that coming. Oh, that was such a cool twist. I just love everything so much. So I'm a whole lot happier with this video, and let's get into it. Starting off the list, let's talk about Ruby and Penny. Now, this might seem like a weird way to start off the list, given that I ended my last video saying that Penny's Return was one of the things I hated most about Volume 7. But even with that... Oh my freaking lord, Ruby and Penny together are just so freaking cute this entire volume. Get to go! Undercover! Maybe! Hey, I have a whole separate video that has just all the cute moments between Ruby and Penny in this volume. I'll link it up above and in the description down below. And oh my god, these two are just so freaking cute together! <laughs> and they were just friends, you know? Friendship is something we really have not gotten to Ruby for a very long time. I mean, we kind of got that with Ruby and Weiss, like the first, second, third-ish volume. Weiss came to respect Ruby, came to trust her, they hung out together a little bit. It was it was nice like that, but it never reached this level of cuteness, and uh, a little sad about that, but very happy we got this here. But really, though, it was just like childhood shenanigans between the two of them, most of the volume. It was just so cute. Oh my god, Penny, just her responses to everything were so adorable. Like when she got uh, thrown... Seven blocks smashed in the ground. Her response literally, Ouch! <laughs> oh my god, Penny, I love you. But yeah, so really like seeing them together. Really just enjoy the happy moments between the two of them. And I'm hoping Penny plays a large role next volume. I'm gonna guess it's gonna be a little less lighthearted given everything that just happened to her in the finale. But uh, hopefully we still get just a few good moments between the two of them. And hopefully Penny doesn't die. Please God, do not let Penny die. Anyway, speaking of death, let's move on to the next one. Summer Rose! Oh, I just made myself sad. Uh, so yeah, after last volume ended, after we got a freaking shot of Summer Rose for the first time, everyone was freaking out, I was freaking out, and we're all hoping, oh, does this mean we're finally get answers? Does this mean we're finally gonna start learning more about our next volume? And we came pretty close. I was hoping for some flashbacks or some long stories about her or something, but we, we got enough. We got enough for this volume. Hopefully that Blanks are filled in more next volume than the one after. Uh, we finally had Ruby freaking ask about her mother. Your mom, Summer, would be proud of you. Her last mission. Was that another Oz secret? We finally freaking had Ruby mention her mother for, like, seriously, was that the first time Ruby has ever mentioned Summer in the entire series? I, I think it was, actually. Wow, that's crazy. Finally had Ruby talk about her mother. She finally asked Crow, so what do you think Mom would feel about all this? Crow's like, oh, she'd keep fighting, but uh, based on Red Like Roses, that might not actually be true. I'm not really sure how canon the songs are, especially ones that old, but the, the song specifically says, don't waste your life on a pointless battle like I did. So it was literally Summer Rose telling Ruby, no, I would not do that. I would not be fighting right now. <laughs> I am just hoping they changed her character after that story came out. Because otherwise, that gets very depressing. And then, oh my freaking god, in the scene where Ruby confronts Salem, which, which almost should have a spot on this list all its own, but I'm mixing these two together. I mean, Ruby stands up to her. She does not show a hint of fear as Ironwood shaking his boots, as Team Ruby shaking his boots, as the Aesop's shaking his boots, all freaking out. Ruby's just standing up to her. We know about you. We know the truth, and we will defeat you. We will overcome you. Just, oh my freaking god, Ruby just standing out as a leader, as the pillar of hope and strength. Just showing really why she is the leader of Team Ruby, because she is the protector. She understands her role. She will save the world no matter what it takes. She will never give up. She will keep fighting. That's why she's Ruby. That's so perfect. And then Salem basically confesses to murdering Summer. And Ruby has a mental emotional breakdown and ends up crying on the floor. Yep. Which kind of, you know, goes counter to my entire thing I just said. But at the same time, even though Ruby's all that, even though Ruby is a hundred side of her heart, even though Ruby wants to protect and save the world, you can't forget, she's still a little girl who lost her mother at a very young age and then watched her 
friend uh, be cut into pieces and then watched her other friend burn to ashes. Ruby has undergone an incredible amount of mental and emotional trauma throughout her life. Like, a ridiculous amount to the point where any other person would be in a ball crying 24-7. But after Ruby lost her mother, she basically realized that if she cried, if she showed her sadness, the people around her would suffer more. So she just blocked out all the pain, just kept pushing forward, kept smiling to make the people around her feel better. And as a result, she has not dealt with any of this trauma in a healthy or emotional way. And I just really love seeing her damaged side. And, and what I love almost even more than that was the fact that she got back up. Like, 30 seconds after a mental breakdown, panic attack on the floor, crying, she stood right back up, became a huntress again, and started arguing for the safety of all people, not just those in Atlas. Which is really shows that, like I said, she's damaged, but at the same time, she is a huntress, she is strong, she will overcome anything. Just hopefully at some point she gets uh, to see a psychologist and deal with all that mental trauma. And just finally, I just really have to praise Team Ruby's reaction, her mental breakdown. Of course, Yang, the big sister, just hold her close, telling her it's going to be okay. That was just so sweet. Blake just going down her knees, trying to help in whatever way she could. I'm not sure what to do. And then there's Weiss. Oh my god. I think Weiss is my favorite here. I heard a lot of people not complain. Well, why is Weiss just standing there? It's because she's literally in shock. The pillar of strength that she has known since the first day of Beacon has literally just collapsed in front of her. And she does not know what to do. She literally is incapable of processing what she has just witnessed here. And it's just so absolutely perfect. I really freaking hope we get this brought up again at some point next volume. Like, just, you know, Ruby and Weiss moment where Weiss asked her if she's okay after what happened. And, you know, maybe Ruby does cry again and just Weiss comforts her this time. Just, please, let this, let this be brought up again. There's more to be said about Summer and Ruby's relationship to her and I want to freaking hear it. Alright, next up, let's talk about the foreshadowing. Because I'm not sure if I was just paying more attention because I was doing the weekly reviews. Or if... It was just because they were one place for the entire volume. But they just did such a freaking amazing job hinting and foreshadowing at things to come without me even realizing some of the times. And it was just so well done. I mean, the first episode, we had the newspapers in the window like, oh, these people have been found dead. Oh, local billionaire is running against hometown hero. I'm like, oh, local billionaire. I bet that's Jacques Schnee. Hometown hero. Oh, I wonder who that could be. It, a lot of us thought it was, you know, Robin Hill, even though didn't know her name at the time. We saw her in the opening, like, oh, it's probably her. I bet she's the one running against Jacques. And let's just, just let us speculate so much more. And the dead people are like, oh, I bet they're doing that to frame Ironwood. Or maybe Ironwood's killing his enemies. It just led to so much more speculation and theorizing. It was so much fun. Uh, then we had Ironwood fighting Oscar in the opening. Everyone was like, oh, no, Ironwood's going to betray Oscar and try to kill him. And then they started sparring. They're like, oh, no, no, it was just sparring. It's okay. And they're like, oh, no, he actually was trying to kill him. I think my favorite, though, was Pietro. We first saw him, you know, the green chair and everything. I'm like, hey, wait a minute. This guy is an expert in robotics. He has a very green scheme to his wheelchair. Could he be Penny's father? Could he be Geppetto? And then we saw the freaking whale on his shelf. I'm like, that's it. He's Geppetto. He's Penny's father. It's confirmed. I uh, did not expect that whale to be foreshadowing something else. You know, the arrival of Salem on the back of a giant flying grim whale. I did not see that coming, but just makes the episode so much better. We also had Weiss talking about how without protection, the cold will clean in a matter of minutes. And then we had Watts uh, take out the heat and everyone started to freeze to death. That's why I said that, so we know that they're about to die if they don't warm up very, very quickly. I thought that just really gave uh, more context to the whole riot scene, but... But yeah, I just think they did so much amazing work with the hinting and the foreshadowing, I just... It made every episode way more enjoyable, because I'm like, oh, they're probably going to put some hints in here about what's going to happen down the road. But one little disappointment, though, was uh, this sign that shows up when Team Ruby and the Aesops kind of have their first official meeting after, you know, they were arrested by the Aesops. Uh, none of this really means anything. It, I mean, there's one little sign about the election watch party, which is kind of important, but otherwise, uh, basically just nonsense. And even worse so, they reuse it in the last episode. Uh, it's only for a fraction split of a second, but you can see it as Team Juniper is running away. So, a little disappointing there. Overall, like I said, made every episode way more fun. Really glad they did it. And excited to see how they improve on that next volume. All right, now number three, Thirsty Moms. <laughs> oh my god, everything about this scene was just the greatest thing ever. 
in the creators of Ruby, when they were asked not any hints they gave about the upcoming volume, they said Thirsty Mom. Everyone was like, oh, 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 that's about Willow because she's a drunk. That's funny. Nope, it's about these women thirsting for good old John. I mean, just everything about this scene was so absolutely perfect. And when John uh, got the first job, you know, walking kids to school, we all had a good laugh at it. Like, ha ha, John got the lame job because he's a lame huntsman. Uh, and we thought that'd be it. Maybe we'd get a shot of the kids disrespecting him, running around him with infusing less to him. But no! We had the kids being completely obedient to him, and all of their mothers, who are apparently all single, I guess, thirsting for him. As if he was like a real huntsman. And then I realized something when I was making this video. He is a real huntsman! At a certain point, John went from the lamest member of the team, the weakest to the worst member, the person who couldn't do anything right, to a strong, confident huntsman, and... You know, when you watch this show, and you watch Ruby for a number of years, the characters' introductions, who they were in the beginning, they stick with you a little more than who they become, and... I think for a lot of us, we were still not really seeing John as he is, not really seeing who he's become, or how he's gotten closer to reaching his full potential. And yet this scene, as... Funny as it was, as amazing as it was, as, as much as I cannot stop laughing at it every time I watch it, it also told us John is a huntsman. John is a strong man. He is someone worthy of respect. And he is a leader. And what's even better, this made him a better leader. Single file line, place a hand on the shoulder in front of you, eyes forward, move, move, move. Show him how it's done, kids. <laughs> he used the skills he learned walking kids to school to help evacuate people halfway through the volume. So not only did this show that he's a strong, confident man and leader, it made him a better leader. And he's really gonna need those leadership skills next volume to deal with Ren, I'm excited to see that, but... Good on you, Kruby, for making this amazing scene that made me laugh, made me look at John New Light, and made him better all at the same time. That was just freaking amazing. And I do just also want to say, uh, the job, walking kids to school, it may not seem like a real huntsman job, but something the Ruby manga has really made me see recently is the job of huntsman is to protect the people in whatever form that takes. If walking kids to school keeps the parents from worrying, keeps the grim from attacking them, that is the job of huntsman, no matter how skilled or powerful they may be. So I really liked all that. Number two, Willow's introduction, and oh my freaking god, I love this scene so much. Just everything about it was so amazingly well done. I mean, just the cinematography in this first shot is these two are so physically far apart. Um, it's okay, Mom. It's fine. In this fairly small office, I mean, it just sets the stage so well as you hear the ticking of the clock in the background. Each second, each moment full of a painful awkwardness as these two just don't know what to talk about. And then when Willow finally has something to say, she apologizes for not being down at the party. I'm sorry I couldn't come down for your party. I'm uh, afraid I'm not feeling well. She forgot Weiss left. Her own mother forgot that her daughter has been missing for several months, probably presumed dead. Yeah, I mean that just shows how damaged and broken Willow truly is. And at the same time, she has this beauty about her that I absolutely love. And then Willow's line about how they all just assumed Jacques was up to something evil all the time was just... I thought we all simply assumed that at this point. So catty and so perfect and so wonderful. And then she looks at her glass and instead starts chugging straight out of the freaking bottle. And you can just see Weiss's look of disappointment and pain in the bottom of the freaking bottle as she's drinking it. I mean, some people said, oh, that's a little heavy handed. But just seeing Weiss's look of agony in the bottom of a bottle was so absolutely perfect. I freaking loved it. And then she asks, you're not here to stay, are you? And when Weiss says no, she cries and she smiles because she's both sad and happy about this. She's so happy that her daughter is leaving this toxic family, that she's not coming back, that she's not going to be made to suffer like this anymore, but also sad because she knows she won't see her again, or will see her very rarely moving forward. Just, oh, it was so well done, and then her final line about how she needs to make sure she saves Whitley, oh my god, that was so freaking perfect, and I am so freaking ticked at you, Weiss, for not listening to her, for not going to... Talk to Whitley after all this. I mean, seriously. That was a whole thing in my hate video, but... Oh my god, I just completely fell in love with Willow in this scene. I loved her. I loved the cinematography. I loved everything about how this scene was made, how it was animated, how it was 
how they made great use of the camera angles. It was just all so perfect and so amazing, and I loved it. So yeah, now Willow is one of my favorite characters in all of Ruby. And little tangent, I would not have thought that if I had read the uh, comic first, because uh, for those who don't know, that Ruby also has a comic, I think, made by DC. Its canonicity is a little questionable at this point. But Willow appeared in one of the more recent issues, and she was uh, much crueler, colder, distant, just an ass, basically all of that. But yeah, this Willow, this Willow I liked. She's damaged, she's broken, she's drunk, but she's still trying to save her kids. She, you know, took the steps to hide cameras all around the mansion so that she could get the proof she needs to take down Jock that ever comes about. And this decision, doing that, does not come without sacrifices for either. I mean, without Jock, the SDC is probably going to crumble. She's probably going to lose this big-ass mansion, and Whitley's definitely going to hate her, so... So yeah, overall, just really great scene. Really love Willow in this, and I just can't wait to see what they do with her next volume. All right, now before I talk about number one, I think we can all agree that Ruby hasn't always done particularly good with the villains. I mean, let's take a look at just some of them. Watts is on board for outright murder and straight-up genocide just because Ironwood didn't pick his project. That's a really stupid motivation. Emerald's on board simply because she loves Cinder or... Sees her as her mother or both. I don't know. That's a very weird, disturbing relationship between the two of them. Really hoping she comes around to the good guy side at some point. Mercury and Tyrion are both straight-up sociopaths. Just love killing, though Tyrion makes it look way more fun. Salem's mad at the gods for not bringing her lover back from the dead. Even though they did kind of do that eventually. So now she's going to destroy all life on the planet. That's a great motivation right there. Still no freaking clue what's going on with Cinder. This volume seemed to apply that at some point she was in a position where she was weak and powerless and she's afraid to wind up going back there again. I'm not sure. I mean, seriously, she's been a villain since I think she showed up in like volume one. Yet we still have no idea what really motivates her, her backstory or anything about that. Really need to fill in some of those blanks. Uh, definitely some speculation that she was from Atlas. You Atlas elites are all the same. You think hoarding power means you'll have it forever, but it just makes the rest of us hungrier! And I refuse to starve. So maybe next volume she'll give a speech about her evil stepmother or something? No idea about that. Neo wants to straight up kill Ruby because she's mad at Ruby for Torchwick being eaten by a Grimm, even though Ruby had nothing to do with that Grimm eating Torchwick. And Adams wanted to straight up enslave humanity because he was mad about how the Fauns were treated and how the SDC branded his face like that. And yet never once went after the Harris to the SEC, even though she was right there, and he clearly had a beef with the company as a whole. That's just really weird. And finally we have Hazel, who's all on board for killing a whole bunch of people, and even children, because he's mad at Ozpin for letting his sister, who was just a kid, go out and die in his war. Honestly, that is a motivation so utterly stupid, I pray to the gods that turns out Hazel's like a deep cover mole inside Salem's organization somehow, some way. So yeah, overall, none of these people really had all that great reasonings and motivations for wanting to join up with an ancient sociopathic witch who's trying to destroy the world. Just saying. So yeah, none of them are particularly good villains, even though Tyrion is a whole lot of fun to watch just being crazy. And yet this volume finally gave us a good villain. Finally gave us a villain whose motivations and reasoning we can understand, whose point of view we can see who we can uh, kind of agree with on certain things. Ironwood! That's right, the number one thing I loved about this volume was Ironwood's ascent into a villain. And I just think it was so amazingly well done. I mean, in the second episode, he literally falls on his knees in front of Oscar, basically worshipping him, begging him, like, please, great Ozpin, tell me, what should I do in this situation? And in the final episode, he shoots him. He kills his mentor. He cuts away the past and decides to move on, go in his own direction, do whatever he must to save the people. And this just makes absolutely perfect sense. We can see it in the first encounter with him. I mean, when he's in the office with them, and Ruby explains, oh yeah, we kind of stole that Atlas ship. Which is the whole little uh, mini panic attack screaming at them. Which You stole an Atlas airship? Which is just hilarious. But Ironwood, he isn't mad, he isn't annoyed, he doesn't berate them for violating the rules. He smiles. He smirks. Because he knows here and now, okay, Team Ruby, you're the people who are willing to get things done, and I know so well how it feels when people just get in your way, when people keep you from doing what you must do. Because 
basically his entire volume was Ironwood wanting to do things and people getting his way, people telling him no, people stopping him. And the best thing is, he was right every step of the way. I mean, a very hotly debated issue this volume was whether or not Team Ruby should have lied to Ironwood about the Lantern, about Ozpin and all that. And, I mean, if they had told him, yeah, still has one question left in it, he could have used that question. He could have asked, what's Salem planning to do to attack Atlas? And then he could have been told, oh, they're going to kill a bunch of people to frame you, then team up with Jock to uh, rig the election, and finally they're going to show up the heat and then show up with a giant army of Grimm and a giant whale, and they'd be like, all right, well, now I can uh, know I'm working with so we can stop that from happening. We can evacuate the city early. We can do this. We can do that. We can save everyone. And later on, you know, he wants to initiate martial law to put the satellite into the air to start the global communication network. And if he had done that, if he initiated martial law like he wanted, if he hadn't been talked out of it by children, then he could have gotten the satellite finished, got it up in the air before Salem ever attacked. He would have won. Then we have the Grim attacking all of Atlas, and he doesn't want to move the fleet. He doesn't want to evacuate the people because... That would mean getting the fleet out of combat position. And if Salem attacked, say, on a giant flying whale with an army of flying monkeys, he wouldn't be prepared for that. And what do you know? Salem showed up with a giant army of flying monkeys, and he's not prepared for it because he's moved his fleet to evacuate the people. Who would have thunk it? And finally, we have his craziest plan. All right, I'm going to take Atlas into the air. I'm going to save whoever I can. And as cruel as that decision may have seemed, it still would have saved as many people as possible from Salem. It still would have protected at least those in Atlas from being slaughtered by an army of flying monkeys. Because even though I'm fairly certain Team Ruby's going to find a way to take out Salem's army, push her away, get them, or get her a chase after them, whatever, next volume so Atlas Mantle won't be destroyed, I'm still thinking a whole lot of people are going to die because of this. Maybe even more than those who would have been lost if they had just left Mantle to die. I'm not sure, but I'm very excited to see what happens with that. So every step of the way, Ironwood was right. He was right. If they had listened to him, if they had done what he had said, if they hadn't gotten his way, they would have been safe. They would have had better plans. They would have a better system to save the people from Salem. And yet, because things kept getting away, because they kept interfering, he's lost time and time again. And so he shoots Oscar. He removes the last impediment, the final thing keeping him from saving Atlas. And I've seen quite a few people online who were like, oh, I hope Ironwood comes to his senses next volume. I do not. I want to see this man, this man who's been pushed to his limit, this man who will do whatever it takes, whatever he must do to stop Salem by whatever means necessary. I want to see how far he goes, and I just want to see how the people around him react to that. I'm sure Winter is going to have a very uh, interesting reaction to finding out that he shot and killed a child. I mean, Crow, that's going to be really fun. I mean, Crow's definitely had a strained relationship since learning Ozpin lied to him, but I still think he's loyal to Ozpin in a certain sense, and I'm just curious to see how he's going to react to that. And what it is I was going to do next. What's the next step for him? Uh, my personal theory, he's going to use the Aura Transfer Machine to take the Aesops and put all of their souls inside his body, essentially killing them and giving him all of their semblance, all their powers, all of their combined aura, so he can fight with the strength of six men, so that he can essentially turn himself into a maiden and find a way to take out Salem. I can't really imagine how this is going to be revealed. Like, Team Ruby runs an Ironwood, and they try to negotiate with him, try to convince him, like, General, listen to us, you have to, and then he just raises his hand, stop, and they're like, wait a minute, that's Marrow's power. And everyone's like, well, Marrow has become a part of me. For the greater good, he sacrificed himself. That would be freaking amazing. I would freak... Seriously, imagine all the Aesop semblance in one person. Just imagine how freaking amazingly OP he will become. At least that's my own theory. Uh, I'm definitely hoping Ironwood stays crazy, stays, you know, cold, heartless, and just willing to do whatever it takes to save Atlas, save as many people as he can. Even means killing 90% of the population, but... Yeah, so those were the six things I love about Ruby Volume 7. I really this volume was an improvement over the last one. It's still, in my opinion, the second best volume because just... Oh my god, volume 3 was just such a game changer. Nothing's going to top that, in my opinion, but... Uh, we'll see about the next volume. I mean, they're fighting a giant whale, and... And the volume is literally going to open with them about to fight the giant flying freaking whale. Cannot wait to see that. Very excited. And my best guess there is Salem's going to arrive and say... Deliver Ironwood and the Relic in 24 hours or I will kill every last one of you. And then it's like the people revolting against Ironwood. That definitely interesting to see, you know. I just see Ironwood like openly firing into a crowd of protesters to get them to turn back. 
Yeah, it seems like something he would do at this point. But yeah, let me think of all this down below. What do you think of my six things? What were the six things you loved about Ruby Volume 7? Uh, anything not on my list? Anything I forgot to mention? Uh, sorry this video took so long to make. I've been very much under the weather and just have not had any energy. I'm probably going to need a nap after recording this, honestly. But be sure to like, subscribe to the next video. And until then, peace.